I got one, two, I got numbers, Jets fan, I got three, four, five, two, Vlad. A night. Hey, Tammy Lorraine, good to see you. Uh, GDZ. That's kind of like young GZ, but GDZ. Janae DG, good to see you guys in here. Good to see you. Thanks for being in here. I am in a, I'm in, I'm in a garage. Um, here in my garage, as Ty Lopez would say. Hey, hey, how's it going, Janae? GDZ, it's the certified public accountant. That's right. Yeah. How you feeling, bro? How you feeling? Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, Catherine. Good to see you. Style storing. Vlad, how's it going, man? What's happening? What's happening? Undeniable. Morning, morning. Rainbows and sunshines. DMT Boston. Anthony J. Conklin. I knew you jumped in here. Do me, guys, do me a huge favor and follow Anthony today. He is interviewing. Um, he's uh, Vicky Fitch is also going to be joining, but he's interviewing um, Tony Robbins. In the middle of your business plan, Janaya, that's horrible. He is interviewing Tony Robbins today. Uh, you guys are familiar with Tony Robbins. It's going to be on Blab tonight. It's going to be the first time that Tony Robbins is ever going to be on Blab. And Anthony's been working on this for a while. And he had a vision and an idea, and it came to fruition. Um, yes, this too shall pass. That, that's exactly what, where it came from for me, um, Nick. So, yeah, check it out. So, yeah, I love Tony Robbins. So check it out. Check out his Blab. You can either follow Anthony, and he should probably have information when he does his scopes, or go to Blab and put in Tony Robbins and Anthony Conklin, and you'll be able to see it. Hey, Paul, good morning. Good morning, Lo. And um, you'll be able to see it. So tonight, I think, is at 6 or 6.30 uh, p.m. Eastern. Um, I have Tony Robbins' uh, his, his most recent book, The Seven Money Secrets, Money Mastery Secrets, or whatever. I have that. Um, I like watching 6 p.m. Okay, 6 p.m. Eastern on Blab. First time Robbins has ever been on Blab. Um, to be able to to be able to get Tony Robbins, do I hear a cameo for you, Avon? Uh, hey, I don't know. Wolfpack, I don't know, man. Um, who knows? But you know what? I'm just excited. I'm excited for him because you know when people that you kind of money master the game. That's it. When you when you when you have people in your life that you you like and you and you and you get to know and you meet uh, digitally, you want to support everybody, and that's kind of what this is about. I, I'm I, you know I, I like to support people. And uh, like I said, I believe in abundance. I've been, you know, the, the universe is taking care of me and it's nothing to do, you know, it's nothing to do with anything. I just, I think it's great. It's, that's not, it's not easy to get a Tony Robbins interview. He is very busy. A lot of us are busy, right? So imagine someone like Tony Robbins who's running an organization in a, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So he's ex exponentially busy. But what allows you to have, when the, what it allows you to do different things is, is when you can free up your time. And so the biggest thing in life is this. You're an English guy's bored as bored as <laughs> Tornado Chaser, I'm going to change your life. Tornado Chaser, I'm going to change your life. So what's very important for is, is that um, I'm happy for Anthony being able to get this opportunity to, to interview Tony and talk to him about whatever he wants to talk about and people can be in there. And uh, uh, so that's great. So so get a chance to get on that. I'm going to jump on that too, try and get home in time to jump on that. And, um, you know, maybe we can learn a lot of things. It's important really to learn. So, uh, with that being said, guys, do me a huge favor. If you are new to my scope, I, I need to call. I need to ask you guys a few things while you're in here. The first is, if you are new, put a one in the chat box, please, so I know that you knew and I can tailor my intro to let you know who I, uh, you know, who I am. Uh, hey, Donna, good to see you. Hey, Carolina, thanks for being in here, Miss Rayborn. Thank you so much, Danny, the poet. Not new, but just been a while. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a minute. Uh, thank you so much, Wolfpack. I haven't seen you in a long time. It's good to see you. Yes, Christian Cotta. He's awesome. Uh, Cap Photos 57, thank you for being in here. I appreciate that. Also, give me some hearts. Now, the second thing I'm going to ask of you guys is to do me a huge, huge favor. It's to share this with your friends and your followers, please. Uh, the main reason is very similar to what I started with earlier. The whole goal is this. Oops, got to go get in trouble. Don't get in trouble, man, but it's math class. Hopefully, you can use it to count your money at some point. Um, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Vlad. I really appreciate that. But do me a huge favor. Invite your friends and followers. Swipe up or left and share the broadcast. Invite your followers. Invite your friends. Get people in here. Why? Because the goal is simple. It's basically to share uh, information and hopefully someone you bring in may be inspired to do something that's great. Uh, and that may, that ends up coming back to you in, in, in multiple, multiple levels. So when I get on people's scopes, when I get a chance to get on scopes, I try to share different things with different people. So I want to make sure we do the same thing. Uh, if you have been on the East Coast and you probably have been buried, we are literally, I'm still buried. This is the reason why I'm in a garage, because the parking lot where I normally park, where you normally see with a lot more light, 
literally is, is, is covered in snow. So we had about four feet of snow on that garage and there's not anybody in there. So yeah, you're stuck there too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it took me almost an hour to get to work because uh, going through streets, I couldn't navigate. Everything turned into one lane. Some of them are one-way streets now because there's only one way that's it's passable and they're still trying to clear out the snow. Uh, I'm in the Washington, D.C. area. So for those who don't know who I am, my name is Abong Eka. I'm a certified public accountant in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm also the author of the best-selling business book, Start Me Up, the No Business Plan Business Plan, which helps people take their ideas, turn them into businesses using a one-page plan or less, and taking their ideas to the marketplace. Uh, I'm also the founder of Economics. We focus on your mission, your mindset, your money. That's my high-end coaching for the most part, a higher end coaching uh, program where I work with people, individuals, entrepreneurs, help them with their brand strategy, help them navigate uh, de determining who their voice, what their voice is, and who they are as it relates to bringing value to the marketplace, help them set their pricing, create products out of their ideas, and then eventually maximize their revenues through the, through the process. Kara Allen's in the house. Good to see you. Check out Kara Allen. She's uh, in the D.C. area as well, probably buried somewhere out in Virginia because of the snow. Uh, she's a stock consultant. Uh, Anthony Conklin, I mentioned earlier, he's interviewing Tony Robbins, a lot of great people here. Uh, I'm working in Dayton this week. Oh, you're lucky, Jania. Very, very lucky. Um, a lot of great people on the scope today. Wendy uh, Wendy Rose Satori, good to see you. Sending a copy of uh, the book out to you too as well. So um, I want to thank you uh, for that. Uh, if you want to find a copy of my book, you just you can go to uh, startmeupbook.com. Tommy Norman, good to see you. Tommy Norman won. Good to see you. I've been out. Uh, yeah, I've been. I literally been. I, I've been hibernating. It's been hard because it's hard. I couldn't do anything. It's a huge setback being stuck. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Carla. Check out Carla Bissong as well. Uh, she has an art gallery in Houston, Texas. Um, African American entrepreneur with a financial mind, uh, just bringing the world of art to that to that area. So ch you know, check her out if you are in Houston. Check out her gallery. She rents it out. She has paint and sips. A lot of opportunities there and events that you can go and see. Uh, Mr. Relentless, thank you so much for saying that. I really appreciate that. Also, earlier on here, you saw DMT Boston. DMT, do me a favor. You find her still on the scope. Hey, uh, Danielle, if you're still on the scope, put some emojis in there for me. Do me a favor. Put some emojis in there. Um, follow her. Her scope's about, you know, rainbows and sunshines, love and light. Uh, but more importantly, um, she's, you know, she's an advocate uh, uh, in the Down Syndrome community, uh, speaker, entrepreneur, um, long line of long, long history of entrepreneurship. So in her life and in her family, I didn't realize that. So I'm really, really excited. There you are. So put, yeah, follow her. Um, she does her scopes in the afternoon, uh, you know, generally speaking. And, and, and it, literally a lot of it is, is about reflection and to, to inspire you to, you know, to think differently and to act. So again, I, I'm, I'm about promoting people who come into my scopes. I really appreciate that. Uh, oh yeah. Copy the book. This is what the book looks like. You can get it here at startmeupbook.com and get a copy right there if you want. Um, if you get it from me, I'll sign it. If you can get it on Barnes and Nobles or Amazon, it's up to you as well. Uh, no, de nada. So today's, um, you know, I think somebody said earlier about this too shall pass. And that's what I was thinking about. Pain is, hey, good morning, healer, Avalora. Every time I see, see you, uh, Avalora, I always think of, uh, boot to boom. And I want to like scream like, uh, your man fits and like, boot to boom. Yeah. And I can't do that because I get in trouble. Um, not socially acceptable. What's going on, Poet Lena? Good to see you. Another, uh, another one. Another great uh, scope. She's, she's in Periscope now. Uh, check her out as well. Um, you know, follow her and learn about her scopes as well. A lot of great people doing scopes on here. Um, suffering is optional. Exactly. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. I was thinking about this. There are a lot of people who are struggling right now who have a setback. True no lies. Good to see you, Yulon. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Amazing Basin, another one. Check her out as well. Please do me a favor and follow uh, Cynthia Basin. I call her the Amazing Basin. I think she's in the south, uh, the southwest of the country, doing a lot of things in the coaching and business space. So follow her out. Follow her her her, um, her scopes. So there are a lot of people right now who are str who are struggling, who have setbacks, and like and like was just mentioned. Pain is inevitable, right? Suff suffering is optional. Pain is going to happen all the time. Exactly, Vlad. Pain is going to happen. But, what, but the, the bigger thing is this. Everything in life is temporary. I just said earlier, this too shall pass. Everything in life is temporary. When you understand that simple principle, the way you frame the world, the way you see the world start to change, when you start to understand that everything, you, everything in life, the good as well as the bad, everything is temporary, right? It may last a year. It may last a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, half of a century. It's still temporary because there's a time limit on it. Your life is temporary, right? The good things that happen to you are temporary. So when, when good things happen to you, it's your, it's your expectation to, to, you know, to, to enjoy it. 
It's your expectation to go through what's happening and celebrate that good thing that's happening to you. When bad things happen to you, when you go through a difficulty, when you go through a setback, it's your responsibility, it's your requirement to sit back and ponder what is happening to me? Why did this happen to me? What can I do to, to avoid this happening again? What can I learn from this particular setback? Does that make sense? So there are people that I meet all the time, people who reach out to me. I get emails all the time, you know, every week from people who've seen my scope, see my, my content. And they always ask me, this is happening to me, and they tell me their story. A lot of times it's a sad story, some bad thing happened to them. See, you got to realize a few things. The bad things, bad things happen to everybody. But the key is how do you learn from that? How do you take what you're, what, what your experience you're going through and apply it to what you want in the future? So if you understand that everything is temporary, when you have a setback, when you have uh, a roadblock, when you have an obstacle, when you have a difficulty, when you, have, when you try something that doesn't work, when you lose thousands of dollars in a business idea and it doesn't work, when you, when you, have, when you get no's from people, how do you learn from that? So the, the example I'll, I'll use is this. So a lot of you guys know the story about how I got my book deal. It took me... Three years, I had to I had to literally reach out to 250 different people. Exactly, Queen Rose, victim or survivor. You had to reach out to you know I reached out to over 250 different people, got no's from over 250 different literary agents and publishers, until eventually I ended up getting a published getting a literary agent, and then she eventually sold my project to a publisher. But the thing is this: after 249. After the first one, I felt like quitting. The second one, I felt like quitting. I felt like quitting all the way up to 250. But I realized one simple principle of life. Massive amounts of effort, massive amounts of action in one particular direction, the universe will yield to you at some point. The will will be broken. But more importantly was this, I realized that if I did, if I did not learn, as I went through all this, and yes, and as you mentioned, perseverance and tenacity, as I went through all this, why I went through all this, all this hardship and difficulty, and go all the whole while being told no, it's very hard to hear no you know, hundreds of times. And as I go through all the difficulty, I went through all the, all the setbacks, I was getting better in my writing. Now, here's a, here's a lesson that I learned from that. So the lesson is that, yes, tenacity and perseverance is one of it. The second part of that lesson was this. After getting told no 250 times and eventually getting, getting, receiving a yes, when I was asked to write the book, they told me to write a 65,000-word manuscript in three months. But the reason why I was able to write the 65,000-word manuscript in three months was mainly because I spent three years right? Getting told no, writing over and over again. You understand what I'm saying? So everything in life is temporary. So when I celebrate, when I got a win, I celebrated it. When I had a setback, I pondered. But when you understand that what you do, what you do today, right, can cement who you are in the future. What you do today can leave the lifetime, a legacy of a lifetime. The book is in a lot, will be in the Library of Congress. The book will be, will be, will be annulled and other things. Why? Because I spent three years prior to that, Writing and writing and writing, being told no. You see what I'm saying? So every single time, did I have great mentors growing up? Um, my mom was one. She raised four kids by herself. My mom raised four, four children by herself. Then my parents split. We lived in public housing in, in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, I love Cam. I'm Canadian uh, originally. I'm about to, about to be American. My mom was amazing. Raised four kids. Came here to this country. Had us. Well, my, my parents were still together. Then my parents split. We came back after a coup in Nigeria in 1983-84. We ended up living, you know, in public housing for over a decade. What people don't realize the simple principle is you learn a lot about someone who's willing to sacrifice comfort, sacrifice food, sacrifice everything to be able to work and, and to work multiple jobs to take care of four kids, right? And I hear people, I hear people complaining about taking care of one child, and this one took care of four kids, and she never complained. Well, she complained occasionally, but rarely. But I mean, which is which is normal. But I mean, she almost never complained. You see what I'm saying? And so, so the simple thing, this the simple point of all this is this: what happens to people happens to everybody. But what 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 matters more than anything else is what you do about it. What do you learn from that kind of stuff? So when people hear my story, when I share the story with different people, when I give speeches, talk about this, I'm glad I'm talking about the book. That's partially where kind of all that comes from. So. Yeah, thank you, Kara. It's like it's like no, it's, 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 no is a necessary process to, to to reach greatness. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so for me, so, so for me, the simple thing is this: yes, the no is part of the process. But what you have to do is when you understand how the no happens, 
right? Then you can navigate better. Then you can alleviate the amount of no's you get in the future. So now I know how to write a book proposal. Now I know what they're looking for. I know exactly what they care about. So now I don't have to go through three years if I want to get another book deal. Well, I mean, I got a publisher now, but if I want to like do go through that process or help somebody through that process, I know exactly what they're looking for, right? There's two ways you learn in life. You either pay for it, right? Or you pay through it with money or you pay through it in time, but you're paying. You're always going to pay. So the people who get information for free, they don't value it the same way as somebody who had to grind for it, who had to hustle for it, right? Because the reason is because they never had to, there's no, there's no exchange. They didn't have to take out the money. They didn't have to take out the sweat. They didn't have to not eat. They didn't have to starve in order to get what they want. So now they can appreciate it. So the person who grinded almost got fired, worked their job, worked their business, and then they sold for $100 million, understands the importance and the, and the fortitude about a buck, you know, than somebody who just wins it in the lottery. That's part of the reason why. You see people who, who, you know, who win the lottery, why they go broke so quickly. They didn't have the financial acumen, but they didn't have the perseverance and the fortitude from the past, from their experiences, to in order to put that in there. You see what I'm saying? So that's why they struggle. That's why they lose. That's for the, one of the main reasons psychologically they lose it. So I had to go. This had to be my lot in life. I've never once in my life ever, as I sit here, and if I'm wrong, Lord, please strike me down. But I've never in my life, I always ask them, I've never asked, why is this happening to me? I've never asked, Lord, what is, you know, why can't I be like this and that person? The reason why is that? The main reason is because I know that everybody's journey is supposed to be unique. But when I understood the simple principle that life, everything in life is temporary. Right. And when I when I get when I when I have a success, I celebrate. And when I have a setback, I ponder every single time. And in life, that's exactly what's going to happen in the challenges that you, that you face. So if you're going through something right now, if you have an idea that's not happening, if something you're trying to do is not working, when you're trying to talk to somebody and they're not understand, not hearing you, you got to understand a simple principle that is that is temporary. That too shall pass. Because at some point in time, when you go, what will people be talking about? The people who come to your funeral, will they, will, they, will they be talking about you complaining? Will they be talking about you crying all the time? Or will they be talking about you, about the things that you left behind, the legacy that you left? Will they be talking about the things you accomplished? Will they be talking about how you made them feel, how you helped them, how you, how you, how you enrich them? Exactly. No whining, care. Exactly. And so, so the main thing, so that's kind of the thing that kind of pushes me and, and makes me, I think about it every single day. I feel like sometimes I carry the weight of the world on my shoulders, but it's okay. You see what I'm saying? So, so, so the bigger thing is, so the, the, the biggest thing is this, with that being said, this is part of the journey that I'm supposed to be a part of. And I'm fine with that, right? Because again, I know that all I have is this, because at some point in time, I'm not talking about afterlife. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about spirituality. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. That's a separate issue, right? You can believe whatever you want. There are people who don't believe and people who believe, Right? Well, all I know is we're all here today. We can we can all realize that. So if you're watching me on the scope, you are here with me. If you're here with me as a result of that, you have an opportunity to do what you're supposed to be doing. You have an opportunity, right, to live the life that you want. You have an opportunity to get what you want in this life. It, some, for some people, it's going to be easy. For other people, it's going to be hard. For some people, it's going to be near impossible. But that's part of the journey. You have to go through that at some point. Otherwise, you may not be able to understand and appreciate what you have to go through. So that's the simple, that's the simple thing. And I want to share that with you guys today. So for you, if you have a setback, you got to look yourself in the mirror and say, this is part of the journey. This shit is temporary. What I'm going through is temporary. Everything I have right now is temporary. This setback is temporary. Everything that I'm doing right now that, I, that, I'm, that I'm, I'm, I'm succeeding in, that's temporary. Because how many people do you know sit on the rest on their laurels? Have a successful business. Rest on their laurels. Don't push the envelope. Don't try for new things. Don't try to learn something new. And as a result of that, they get supplanted and replaced by the upstart in the garage. How many times have you seen that? How many times do you think Microsoft is kicking themselves about the, about the cell phone and Windows? How many times do you think BlackBerry is kicking themselves about their phone? I used to have a BlackBerry. The president had a BlackBerry. Every major corporation used a BlackBerry. But within a year, two year period, a man with a black turtleneck and glasses got on stage and said, I'm creating a new phone and you guys can kiss my ass. And all of a sudden, BlackBerry almost faces bankruptcy. The guy who founded BlackBerry gets fired. Everybody is struggling with BlackBerry. BlackBerry is now the, the, the little brother, stepkid, immigrant child in, in a country that doesn't like immigrants type in the cell phone industry. Why is that? They thought success was permanent. 
They thought what they were doing was permanent. They thought they were gonna, they were gonna, like BlackBerry is gonna be, is gonna be the, be the stuff forever. It's iPhone and Samsung right now. Everything's been replaced. Remember Nokia? And I had a Nokia phone about 10, 15 years ago. Nokia was a thing. Ericsson was a thing, right? They've been replaced. Why? Because they, they weren't on their grind though. They, they thought that what they had was permanent. They thought they had everything sewed up. And so you're right, you can't sleep. I'm not saying you gotta be, I'm not, I, I'm not trying to also encourage you guys to be, uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, overly cautious, right? And to be par paranoid. But in the same token, hey, what's going on from Denmark? I love Denmark. Um, I almost played, I almost played bas professional basketball in Denmark. Ros Roskild, I think that's the name of the team. Uh, the name of the city, but the team in that city, Roskilde, a long time ago. But anyways, and so there are a lot of people who rest on their laurels and they're happy. Exactly what Mark Cuban said. I know you like Mark Cuban, but yes, like Mark Cuban, right? Every single time is a grind. And, and like, I get it, but you know, sometimes I rest too long, right? In, a, in the last couple of years, I should have been exploding certain things, but I got want to encourage you guys. Everything is temporary. When you understand that everything is temporary, when someone's saying, Hey, you got that business, you got that business off the ground. You got a million dollar contract. Why don't you rest? Let's go celebrate. You celebrate your victories, right? But celebration again is temporary. It has its time and its place. And it has something. I mean, even back in the Bible, Ecclesiastes, it talks about for everything, there's a season, right? Same thing with life. You look at, you don't say, we don't even talking about, religion. You say, say you basically, you're a farmer. Everything has its proper season. If you try to plant your seeds in the winter right now, you will be sorely disappointed. Why? Because everything has its place and everything has its season, right? Your dreams has its season. There are a lot of you who are sitting on your goals and your dreams right now because you think you have a you have a long runway to do this. You think that it's a lot more permanent than you think it is, but you got to understand the opportunity is temporary. If you don't utilize the opportunity in the lifetime of the opportunity, you may miss out on something of some level of greatness that you never even thought was possible in your life. And how many people do you know sit back and say, I had that idea once, or I was going to do that business once, and all of a sudden everybody and their dog is doing it, and they're, they're the ones making mi millions and everything else, and you're sitting back watching, being a consumer. So I just want to remind you guys, ever-evolving life, exactly. Everything, everything has a season. You see that in nature, you see that in life, you see that in spirituality, but in the same token, everything is temporary. When I understand everything is temporary, you have a better opportunity in life to live the, the life that you want because you won't take time for granted. So guys, thank you for doing, doing thank you for sharing this with other people. I want to thank you for doing, I thank you for being here. I thank you for being with me in this personal moment. I don't, I don't know, I just feel like sharing it. Sometimes I speak, I get emotional. First time from Dallas, Texas. I love Dallas, Texas. Good to see you. Good to see you. Positively speaking, I spent about a month in Dallas last year for a client. I love Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas is phenomenal. I was staying in Addison, Farmer's Branch, um, Carrollton, Texas, like in that area. I was, that's where I came, my, my hotel was, and then my client was in that area. So thank you so much, Queen Rose. Thank you so much, Poet Lena. Thank you, thank you, Cynthia, for inviting uh, your friends and followers. Thank you, everybody, for inviting your friends and followers. Traditional publishers are having their lunches from... Exactly. You see why traditional publishers are suffering? Because for the same actual reason. They're resting on their laurels, right? Look at the way technology has leveraged everything now. I don't necessarily need a TV show. I do want a TV show, and I'm working on that, but I don't really need one. There are a lot of people make... There are people, right? You can watch certain people who have more viewers on their Periscopes and Meerkats and YouTubes than most TV shows have on their show that they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, producing. To this day, it literally has become one of the biggest equalizers. Technology has, been one of be has become one of the biggest equalizers. I initially always talk about that. It's become one of the biggest equalizers. You have an opportunity right now for whatever it is you want to talk about, whoever you are, to create your brand, create your message. My ability to create my brand online and through streaming has allowed me to partner with corporate brands. As a result, I speak for them. I do different events with them and I get paid to do that. And so, so for you, you have the opportunity to do the exact same thing. And, and that is the thing that I want. That's the thing that I, I want to encourage people to do. Um, you're on TV. You're on a TV show right now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You Thank you so much. This could be a television show. You tell you, look at what's happening with blab, right? It, like, it, like Anthony's probably still not on here, but Anthony's interviewing Tony Robbins. Had it not been for a platform like Blab, what would you possibly do? Maybe Skype. If you did Skype, how would you take that 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 filming that, and where would you where would you distribute that? Maybe YouTube. But that time is too late. But that time is too late. And so what the thing is that people have to realize is Blab allows you to do. You can do a live interview TV. 
Uh, Periscope does some live streaming. As I mean, the news comes live quicker than anybody before they can send a reporter out. Every very quickly. So, so, so the biggest thing is this. Oh yes. Oh, uh, you sent me something. Oh, cool. Thank you so much, Kara. I appreciate that. Um, oh, maybe you're asking me. I don't know. Um, hustle, hustle, hustle. So yeah, you gotta hustle. And so if you have something you're trying to you trying to do, you gotta hustle. You gotta ask, and that's all it takes. When when they tell you no, they may be telling you no for a multitude of reasons. You're sending me, okay? No, no sending. Um, it may be a multitude of things reasons why they say no. The goal is to find out why they're saying no, because it could be no because they're not in the mood. It may not be because your idea is, is bad. So thank you so much, uh, C. L. Smith. Um, look at my yeah, look at my space. They rested on their laurels. There's a whole there's a whole graveyard full of businesses and companies that started out that were great and that are literally like they're littered they're, the graveyard's been littered because they rested on their laurels. Friendster was another one, uh MySpace, all the search engines, Yahoo was another one. Yahoo had an opportunity to buy Google for a million dollars. The CEO of Yahoo laughed at Sergey Brin and Larry Page and Vinod Kosla, who brought them in to speak to him. Vinod Kosla is one of the early shareholders of Google. They laughed at him and told him to get out. Who's laughing now? Google can buy Yahoo with one of their divisions. You see what I'm saying? Rested on their laurels for a million dollars. When Larry, Larry, I think Larry paid, no, Sergey Brin was at University of Maryland doing doing um, his master's or PhD in something. And then he went, he did his master's at Paris. His dad is a professor at Maryland. And then he, they met at Stanford because they're doing their PhD together. They wanted to sell Google because they wanted to focus on finishing their PhD. They didn't know, they didn't see the idea of where this could go. And when they met with a business person, that kind of opened up the opened up the space. And then they bought another company called I think I forgot the name of the company, but that's the company that first started uh, sponsored search. So they went and they acquired that company, and then they turned it into what Google is today. Uh, and 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 that changed that literally changed the game of, of related search. Now. Remember this, guys. You guys may or may not be old, old enough to remember this, but if you go back to look how search was back then, you put it. You, you never got anything because you'd put in something like uh, TVs, and you get every single thing on the internet that ever, that ever mentioned television, with no related, no related search at all. You can put TVs for sale, and now with Google, you get specifically what you want based on your zip code, based on what you last searched. Like the specificity is ridiculous, and because it's so specific, you are more willing, you are more likely to buy it. You hear what I'm saying? Because you're giving exactly what you're looking for. So it's part of the buying the purchase ladder. It's part of the value ladder. That's the term, right? So when you give somebody what they want, leading up to what they're when they're about to purchase, they become in the buying mode. And it makes perfect sense. Why do you think it's so why Amazon is so addictive? Why do you think Amazon is so addictive? When they when you buy something, let's say this is what you also bought. You can buy this too. This complements this, right? People used to have to use Boolean techniques. Exactly, exactly. And so, and so, so back then it was just crazy. And so Google changed the game, but Yahoo had an opportunity to, to, to purchase this technology. Instead, Yahoo was buying media companies because they were so forward, they were so short-sighted. They didn't see the long game of what, of what certain technologies were going to bring. AOL had a very similar uh, path. They went and bought, you know, blog companies and bloggers and stuff like in, in Gadget and um, um, I can't remember what else, Mash, not Mashable, and Gadget and HuffPost and stuff like that. Rather than seeing like maybe a longer future, now they're looking for sponsored, sponsored user-generated content. Anyways, it's a separate issue, separate, separate scope. Oh, thank you guys for being here, guys. Again, at the end of the day, hey, you got any Q and A? If you have any questions, let me know real quickly um, before I peace out. Um, uh, yeah, I gotta go. My phone's about to die too. So if you have any Q and A, let me know real quickly while I'm here, because um, I'm about to, I'm about to go, and um, I want to try and get some work done because I need to get out of here before rush hour starts again in a couple of hours, because it's going to be crazy. Um, guys, I want to thank you guys for being here, but more importantly, I want to remind you that life is temporary. Good morning, Stephanie. I hope you got my email. Um, I'm going to try and pitch some stuff for you so we, we can talk. Um, hope you got my email. Stay in touch. I'm going to start blogging a little bit more. Any tri-state visits coming up? You know what? Not so much. You know what? True No Lies, that's one of the bigger products I'm looking at later in the year. And uh, what I want to do later in the year is um, is uh, have like kind of like have a tour for small businesses. How many times did you have to rewrite your book before it was accepted? Uh, C.L. Smith, great question. Uh, I wrote it once. So this is, so this is a, quick, a quick version of the story. I um, I pitched the idea. Let me know how I can assist you in any way. Oh, thanks so much, Paul. I appreciate. I really appreciate that. So C.L. Smith, I, I want to say C.L. Smooth, like it's in Pete Rock and C.L. Smooth. But um, C.L. Smith, so what happened was 
um, I, I pitched the idea. I, I've been pitching book ideas for a while. I didn't pitch this particular book idea until, until later, I, until I created, um, until I created a relationship with a, with a literary agent and a publisher. So I've been trying to pitch personal finance for a while. Um, I realized there's really no money in personal finance. In my, in my estimation, it's very difficult to make money in personal finance. Um, you're competing with Susie Ormans and Dave Ramsey's. The reason why their books do well is because they built a platform first. So here's a simple, here's a simple book thing. At some point in time, I'll maybe do a book workshop, um, publishing workshop, but this is it. Your ability to get your book picked up is not about the content of the book. Your ability to get a book picked up by a publisher and even sell it comes to your platform, um, your existing platform. What media platform do you have? What access do you have? Do you have email? Do you have an email? Um, you know, do you have a long list of emails you, you collected, like email uh, list? Do you have uh, an audience of people you can sell it to? Maybe you're a corporate speaker and you can sell it to like 100 corporations and they can all buy 10,000 each. Like stuff like that matters more. There are books out there that are, that are in the bestsellers that you've never heard of. That they're never not really in bookstores, mainly because they're able to sell the book. So from a publisher's perspective, it's all about economics. Not my economics, E-K-A-N-O-M-I-C-S, but their economics, the actual money of it. How much it costs to produce, how much are they going to pay you in advance to do everything else and do some marketing and then eventually sell it. So any publisher will do a deal with you if you can show them that you can sell the book and if you have the platform to, to deliver it. Then the second thing is this. So I'd been pitching personal finance for a while and I started migrating. I, I turned my, my focus into small business because I started seeing more of a need for that. A lot of freelancers and small business owners and people struggling with trying to start a business. And I, I also saw that people were willing to spend money to learn how to build a business to start a business than they would to learn about how to save money in personal finance. Again, that's just my observation. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm, I'm not saying I'm wrong. This is something I believe. And so, so as a result, as a result of all that, um, I ended up pitching a, la a small business project that, did, that, that wasn't picked up, but I had a publisher who wanted me to write a book about accounting. And so I said, I don't want to write a book about accounting. I'd rather write a book about um, my book, about Start Me Up and how like the four areas people need to focus on. I had, a, I had a personal story with somebody who took forever to write a business plan because they didn't know, what, they didn't know how to write one. I used to write business plans in the, early in the late 1999s, early 2000s, during the dot-com uh, uh, days. And... I realized that people were wasting their time. I interviewed, I knew bankers. Too. They know, no one ever read it. Investors never read business plans. None of them did. This is something that you did, right? Something that you do, but nobody ever reads it. And so I realized that it was a waste of time, especially for people who weren't looking for funding initially. And there's a better way because people aren't lending to startups anyways. Go ask your banker. They won't give you any money. Guarantee you. So as a result of that, hey, Douglas, thanks for being here. So um, thanks for sharing. So as a result of that, after I got a literary agent, um, she told me I had to, um, they said, okay, write a proposal. So the proposal was 30,000 words. I, I, I turned around a 30,000 word proposal in about maybe two and a half weeks. Um, because I'd already had the idea. I knew exactly what was supposed to go in there. I've been writing proposals for a long time. So I knew exactly what was supposed to go in there. I knew I was supposed to st structure the platform. I knew, I, was I, know how, I knew how, how I was supposed to describe potential competition and who would buy the book. I knew I knew kind of knew the, the skeleton, what, what it would look like. So it was easier for me to fill in the blanks. So as a result of doing that, then I got the book deal. Um, hey, from England. Hello. Sorry, I didn't mean to. I, I, every time I hear England, I start trying to do the accent. And it sounds horrible. I apologize. Good to see you here from England. I used to live in England. I used to live in South London. I used to live in Croydon um, when I was playing professional basketball. So, so when that happened, so when that happened, I got the book deal. I pitched a proposal. And then, hey, Tiggy. Um, and then I had to go write the book. So when I went and wrote the book, that's what happened. It was only, it literally, C.L. Smith, long story. Uh, that was one. It was like one take. It was. I wrote the book. I I, I showed them the, the chapters. I changed the chapters a little bit, but um, I wrote the book in one take. So that was that's basically in three months. That's exactly what I had to do, and uh, it literally gave me three months. And I didn't. If I did not accomplish, it was in my contract. If I did not accomplish this in three months, they would pull the deal because they wanted to publish it at a certain time. And then they, and then they, and then they pay you in advance. I got an advance, and they pay me my advance over three periods. So you don't get paid right at once, all at once. So the point is this: it is easier if you are already famous. It's easier if you have a TV show you're on. If you're a celebrity, if you are, you know, you can get on Jimmy Fallon. If you have your own TV show, like it's easier to do that then because in their minds you're thinking I can just talk about it on TV and it's a wrap, and I can get on. It's easier for you to get on um, uh, places to pub uh, to to get publicity. So that's exactly why. Um, why people like Snooki can have a bestseller, even though the book is, it's, she, she didn't write it. Most people don't write their own books. Most people don't write their own books. That's why when you see a book that says, you know, you know, Joe, famous Joe, per, famous Joe Smith. And underneath that, it'll be like with so-and-so, or sometimes they even hire ghostwriters where they pay them not to talk, not to say anything. They'll, they'll interview them and then they'll write the book for them. 
right? And that's it. And that's a ghostwriter. So there's multiple ways of doing it. If you, if you have 30, 40 grand, you can hire a ghostwriter. Um, I had to write it myself. I didn't have 30, 40 grand to pay on writing a book. And my advance was less, so it didn't make any sense. So that's exactly how it works. That's, that's the book game. The goal is simple, building your platform. So whatever, when you build your platform, and you can do that through a book as well, but again, self-publishing also levels the playing field, and self-publishing gives you an opportunity to, uh, to share your message without having to rely um, on traditional publishers, and that's why they're taking a beating, and that's why they're very selective in what they choose. So for me, it was a goal for a year, over, over a decade, to get a book published traditionally. I wrote a, I wrote a book back in like, 19, like 2001 or 2002 or something like that. Like a, yeah, I wrote a book in 2002. Um, about basketball, which is a little bit different, but that, that wasn't when I was published. I mean, I don't even know if it's still around. I don't even know where it is, but anyway, I hope that answered your question. If you guys have any other questions, um, I gotta get going. This is actually t- took a lot longer than I thought. Platforms are key. I want to yeah, platforms are key, Doug, Douglas. Exactly. I still publish my books. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much, Seal Smith. You're welcome. And, um, Again, if you if you if you create the platform, because again, when you go to an organization, depending on what you're writing, depends on what you're talking about. When you go to a place to talk, I am the author of X, Y, and Z. This is what I also would say: if you sell, if people who sell publish who do it, who, who already do this, you know, I, I'll, this this my my insight's not for you because you're already doing it. But for those, yeah, I know, famous last words. So for those who want to sell publish who haven't self published yet, the thing is this: you want to spend money in two areas, okay? Um, you don't need to, you can write it, you know, in, 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 you know, in Microsoft Word, all that stuff. You'll spend money in two areas. The one area you want to spend money on is the graphic designer who will design the cover of your book. Plain and simple. You can have a, a physical book book. I, I like having physical copies. You know, I, my book's also on Kindle. It's also in a Nook at Barnes and Nobles and Kindle on Amazon. But you got you got to get somebody to design the book, right? Um, if you don't have a publisher, find somebody, spend a little bit of money and have someone design the, the, the cover, Right. Don't do the covers that they do with self-publishers allow you to make your own cover or some free. Don't skimp on that, because, again, when people say you can't judge a book by its cover, it's because people judge books by their cover. The reason that the reason that saying exists is because people judge books by their covers. Right. Someone says you someone says you can't judge a book by its cover It's because everybody judges a book by its cover. So with that being said, if that's the case, then you can't, you know, you can't have a supermodel wearing rags and you expect to, oh, this person's beautiful. That's not how it works. So you got to, you got to spend the money to find out how to, how to get the best cover that fits your message and who you are. The second thing is for website and article writing. Uh, yeah, you can totally do that. Uh, Janelle, I do that. I, I've done that a few times in the past, like years ago. I used to, I used to have a person who writes articles for me. Um, I'd give them the insight. They do the research. There's two ways. You can pay somebody to write an article for you for a couple dollars on freelancer.com. Um, or you could, um, they should not, but they do exactly seal Smith. So you can find somebody a couple of dollars to, to put some articles in. I, I, I pay people to research for me and organize it. And then I write it myself, but I cut the price. I cut the time down, uh, astronomically. So, um, website to pay for somebody to do website. You can do that. You have a VA do that a virtual assistant. That's totally cool. Um, I actually advocate that in my book. Uh, it, it's important because you want to spend your time doing other things. And the other thing is, um, so the two things. First thing is uh, pay somebody to, um, yeah, catch a replay, Vlad. Vlad, thank you so much for coming back. Um, the first thing is you want to pay somebody for the cover. And the second thing you want to do is you want to pay somebody to edit, right? Because I don't care who you are. I, I read a lot. I like to write. I think I'm a pretty good writer in terms of the, the way I sp- my speaking. The people who read my book, the way I speak when I write, it, it's, it's very similar to the same. And, and, and it actually, it's very poignant. I get to the point. I can, you know, so it's very, it's very well. I, I think I write well. But the, but the bigger thing is this. You want somebody else not to, I don't mean proofread it. You want to get somebody to edit it because you want to make sure that what you mean to say comes out in the way you intend it to be, right? And an editor, a second set of eyes, not only not only proofreads what you write, but also can maybe pre- uh, present that to you in the way that, that sounds the best. So I had one of the best editors in my publisher, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal people, uh, and also uh, for sightings too. So you want to make sure too that if you mention anything, you have the support for it, for your bibliography, whatever you want to call it, um, your referencing in the back so you can reference things that you cite. Uh, it, it just, it is, it's a, it looks like a very, it looks like a nicer, this comes down to a nicer looking, um, nicer looking experience, uh, for the, for the book reader. The last, the worst thing in the world is you have a nice book, nice cover, and then there's a bunch of nonsense in it. So editors are good at putting personality. Exactly, 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 exactly. So it all comes down to what you're, how, what you're writing and what you're trying to, what you're trying to share with people. So 
You offer, oh, you do. Okay, that's awesome. You know, from exactly, that's awesome. Oh, so if you want an editor, take a look at Seal Smith. I bring people together. All right, I'm out. Have an amazing Tuesday. I may scope again tonight. See you guys.